And then I think we're going to get started. Welcome, everyone. So good of you to be with us today for this uh, next session of the Big Corp Global uh, Climate Summit. Uh, these ones a bit more focused on action strategies. Um, it's wonderful to, to host you uh, here today. Today, we have a, a very exciting uh, session for you scheduled, uh, very much focused on, on scope three emissions. You can go to the next slide, Elena. Perfect. So the topic of today's conversation is how to measure and reduce your uh, scope free uh, emissions. Uh, this is a topic that lots of people find uh, very challenging because it's all about those indirect uh, emissions, of course. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. My name is Joey. I am the business development lead of, of PLAB Europe. Uh, and I will be uh, your host today. Uh, I have the great honor of well, talking you through some of the content, but also uh, initiating the conversation with our amazing guest speakers. Speaking of, we have quite a few uh, amazing guest speakers with us today. We have Ellen and Jos, uh, both from uh, Big Corp Climate Neutral Group from the Netherlands, as well as uh, Carol, uh, who is calling in from Spain, uh, who works with Big Corp uh, EcoAlf. I'll introduce them to you in, in, in just a little bit more uh, when we will be uh, hearing from them. But first, let's take a look at the program for today. So for today's session, like I said, we will be zooming in on those scope three emissions. And our intention uh, for this session is that you feel more knowledgeable about addressing those scope three emissions uh, in your company, uh, or maybe with some of the clients that you work with. And those desired outcomes that we hope to achieve uh, are that you gain uh, a lot of uh, insightful information, that you are able to explore uh, strategies, and that you are able to learn from practitioners and generally understand more about what actions you might be uh, able to take. But the big topic of today is, of course, the scope three greenhouse gas emissions. And for those that might be uh, unfamiliar with what scope three is all about, scope three emissions. Uh, are the result of the activities from assets not owned or controlled by the reporting organization, but that the organization indirectly impacts in its value chain. So these scope three emissions are all about you know, the things, the activities that are happening in your value chain that you might not be directly involved with, but that you are able to uh, influence uh, through the relationships with your partners in your value chain. And the interesting part about those scope three emissions are, of course, that the scope three emissions of one company are also part of the scope one and two emissions of another company. So what are we gonna do today? We have uh, a few things planned for you. Uh, first, we will be hearing from a climate neutral group, from Jos and from Alan, who will give us a bit of a lecture on what scope three emissions are all about uh, and looking into some of the strategies to address it. There's the option for Q and A, both with uh, uh, with, with Jos and Ellen, uh, but also, of course, with Carol later on, uh, and we'll wrap up with an interview with Carol about uh, eco alf strategies to address their scope three emissions. Um, I'm your host for today. Uh, we have uh, a, a few wonderful guest speakers that are, of course, also practitioners in the field. So we hope that you are able to learn a lot, not just from the theory, but also from the practice. And of course, if you have a uh, your questions, please address them to us because that's how we facilitate knowledge exchange, of course, by interactive discourse. A few rules, uh, please keep your cameras on, makes it a bit more interactive for us, even when we're in a digital environment. Keep your microphones muted and use the chat for uh, any questions or comments that you might have. We'll take about one hour for this session and we'll wrap up at 3.15 Central European time. So without further ado, it is my great honor to introduce some of the guest speakers. If you can go one slide back, Helena. All right, there we go. Lots of slides going on, but we're introducing uh, uh, both Ellen, and, uh, Ellen Brouwer and Josko Zijnsen from Climate Neutral Group. Uh, Ellen is the certification and supply chain expert uh, who will be able to talk to you much more about some of the work the Climate Neutral Group does. Uh, whereas Jos might be even more knowledgeable uh, about some of the uh, uh, technical uh, knowledge that is required in this field. So without further ado, I'd like to give the word to you, Alan, and maybe before you start, you can also tell a little bit more about yourself and about your great colleague, Jos. 
you're currently on mute. Of course, <laughs> of course I was on mute. So hello everybody, um, nice to meet you here in this um, uh, digital area uh, where everything is done going uh, this way. So my name is Ellen Brouwer, uh, pleased to meet you. I'm also um, here together with my colleague Jos. We're working for Climate Neutral Group and uh, yeah, I'd like to share my presentation if that's okay. You can just share your screen. Yes. Is it working? Yes, we can now see your PowerPoint. Great. So we're going to talk about how to measure and reduce your scope three emissions. And I'm going to present you a bit of a pragmatic approach that CNG has developed. Um, a little bit about Climate Neutral Group. Um, our mission is to support companies to go from A to zero CO2 to realize a net zero carbon economy by 2050, which is really in line with the Paris Agreement. Um, we have some offices uh, in the Netherlands, that's where our headquarters is, then South Africa and in Belgium. We are actually B Corp certified since uh, 2015. We are an ICROA member and we are in the process of becoming an ICL member. And, you know, that's a lot of talking, but really what we have achieved is we have supported over 3000 companies globally and cut over 10 million tons of CO2. So that's quite a bit. Um, we have um, sort of developed our A to zero CO2 approach composed of four different steps. We help companies to prepare and develop their footprint for their products, organizations, or services. Um, we have a team of expert consultants that help companies to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, we sort of act as a broker to deliver credible offsets to compensate in case of remaining emissions that cannot be reduced yet. And we have a full-fledged certification scheme um, sort of the cherry on the pie that um, um, allows um, uh, companies to either claim a climate neutral product organization or service when compliant with the standards. So CNG is really your expert, I would say, who can assist you with measuring and reducing your scope three emissions. We have a team um, that is there to assist you. Um, as I was saying, we have developed a climate neutral certification program. And what we find very, very important is that we make it mandatory that you have to reduce yourself. So only offsetting is not enough. And we have developed the following targets. If you want to become certified for an organization, you need to go down to an absolute zero by 2050. And that's, of course, that's not easy. Um, if you're um, getting certified for your product or service, you need to reduce your emissions with 25% by 2030. And I want to focus on this because these are mainly scope three emissions that occur in your value chain. So we have developed a pragmatic approach to measuring um, composed of six steps. I will go through all of these steps one by one and hopefully that gives you a little bit of a flavor. Of course, presenting all of this in just 15, 20 minutes is not doable, but I hope it gives it makes you enthusiastic to see if you can start this trajectory for yourself. And just to clarify, when I'm talking here about scope three emissions, I'm mainly talking about the emissions that are associated with the life cycle of a product. And we measure those per unit product. So per kilogram coffee, something like that. And these are really all the emissions that resulting from all the activities in your supply chain, from raw materials, procurement, all the way to, to uh, delivery to consumers, use by consumers and disposal of the products. So the first step in all, the, in all of this is what we think is very useful if you really start mapping your supply cha chain. Really just spend some time on finding out how is actually my supply chain composed and who play a role. And sometimes there's even people there or companies there or links there that you're not even aware of. So really make an effort. And then identify your own, your own position. So what is your situation? What is your position in this supply chain? Who do you engage with? And then you're going to determine the boundaries of the footprint. So up to where do you want to include the emissions that are occurring? 
Is it up to gate level, up to shelf level, or up to grade, grave level? And in our certification program, we make it mandatory that you include up to shelf level. So that's important to realize as well. Uh, this is the food, uh, the, the supply chain of a banana supplier. So you can see different um, links in the supply chain. And I just want to use this as, a, as an example. Secondly, second step is that you per link, per supply chain link, you're going to define all the relevant or significant emission sources. And of course, you can use the greenhouse gas protocol. This is the famous picture that everybody is using. This is sort of your starting point. And we have converted this, this sort of nice picture into a checklist in our standard that really gives a full-fledged overview of all the possible emissions that can occur. And you can do this exercise for every single supply chain link. So you can see for every single supply chain link which emission sources are relevant. And what you then get is sort of an overview that per link, you're going to identify the relevant emission sources, which ones are really contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. And once you do that all together, you sort of create an inventory of emission sources and you're going to decide whether or not they're relevant. Are they significant enough? Um, once you have done that, we go to the next step. Per link and per emission source, you're going to define where you're going to get your data from. What is the most reliable and pra pragmatic way? And it can differ. So per emission source, perhaps there's a different approach most suitable. Uh, and here you make a distinction between primary and secondary data. Primary data is data that's based on real figures, your own uh, real figures, like real figures that have happened. Secondary data is usually data from literature studies, databases, etc. And then you're going to also take a look at, okay, what kind of tools can I use? Sometimes you, yeah, it's, it's very useful to, 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 to make use of modeling tools like CIMAPRO. Sometimes um, separate LCAs have been done already on um, uh, certain uh, emission sources. And sometimes there's even environmental product declarations available that sort of state the emissions per activity already done also by somebody else. So... And you're, of course, going to check which emission factors are most reliable. So how this could look like in practice, just to make the example concrete, for instance, if you want to calculate the emissions occurring at plantation sites, a banana plantation site, you could model banana production in CIMAPRO with EcoInvent 3.5 data, for instance. And that is, that is a way to do it. Um, and the result is that you get this fantastic overview flowchart, and you get an output and that is then your output at production level. Could be the case, and this is what we have actually done in this banana case. Could be the case that, for instance, for packaging, um, you're going to use the um, uh, emission data that was investigated by another uh, expert company, in this case, the LCA Center, and they had done a whole LCA on the packaging material, so we could use that outcome for that particular emission source. For shipping, we were using data that Maersk, uh, the shipper, had provided to us. And they had done a sample whereby um, their uh, shipping routes were being um, measured all the time in terms of how much emissions it cost. Um, the sample was um, taken as an, as an average. And uh, that sort of um, became, for that specific routing that we have applied also for our bananas, that became sort of the, um, yeah, the emission. And that was verified by an external party, by a certification body. So that's how we use that. For riping, we actually had, so there, the, the emissions that occur there are mainly related to gas and electricity use. We used the real gas and electricity invoices and uh, had to proportionally allocate that to the amount of sales. Um, why is that? Because the riper has also used its facility for other commodities besides bananas. So there you have to use an allocation approach but based on real sick figures. Transport, you're using the actual kilomo kilomo kilometers and, and multiply that with the most realistic em emission factors, so also real data. For retail, it was decided that these emissions are insignificant and could have been eliminated. Of course, there were many, many, many other um, emission sources. I just want to give you a quick snapshot of how you could do this in practice. What you're going to do then is once you have that env entire inventory, once you have calculated all the emissions per emission source, you add up everything together and then you quantify per unit product. And then you sort of get an overview like this. 
with the total amount of emissions per kilograms banana. In a nutshell, and what is then very important because in these kind of calculations, you usually um, you do a lot of assumptions, you use a lot of different data sources, you do a lot of subcalculations, a lot of allocations, and it's very important that you're going to be transparent in what you've done so that the reader of your study or head can actually in understand why you've taken certain decisions, why you've decided to include or exclude certain emission sources, etc., etc. So transparency is key. Now, once you have actually measured your emissions, it's about time to start reducing them. I think that's really, really important. There is There are so many opportunities and there are so many possibilities that how you can reduce. What we would like to encourage you is to focus first on the low hanging fruits, the quick wins, and then start already now reserving budget for the big bets. Sometimes those big bets, they take a little bit more time, they require some investments before they pay off, but really, um, start investigating now what the opportunities are for the long run and start reserving budget. Likewise, at the same time, you can engage already right now with your supply chain partners, mobilize everybody to start reducing their own emissions. Somebody else's scope one and two emissions are your scope three emissions, so things are possible. And use your negotiation power. And in this whole process, these three sort of opportunities, you can explore and be creative. But for all of them, you need to be committed and prepared to pay a little more. So an example of a quick win. Um, so now moving from the bananas to the aluminium poles. This is something that we had um, worked on together with a client of ours. Um, they first had only prime billets that they purchased. So these prime billets resulted in a net footprint of 42.87, as you can see here, green circle. Then they went to, um, then they moved into remelt, recycled billets. And you can see the emission factor is a lot lower. And this, the same volume, almost the same volume, 1792 and 7080, this resulted in a decrease of their footprint, and that's substantial. Went from 42.87 to 17.26 by just procuring other material, other raw material. Another one, and this is an example of how you can engage with your supply chain partners. This is an example from an online retailer that is also our client. Um, they have set up a range of reduction measures related to their packaging strategy, which is approximately 25% of their footprint. So it's really substantial. And one thing that they did is they really started up a collaboration or partnership with their main uh, packaging supplier. Um, and they engaged them to reduce their own footprint. And finally, they're even in the process now to become climate neutral certified against our program also. So, you know, you see this is sort of like a snowball effect. If one starts, then the next will hopefully follow. Um, and one of the things that they also did is with their supplier, they negotiated that um, because this online retailer often repacks things. So they started to, to make sure that whatever the supplier was providing was already packed in the right material and wasn't, there was no additional box needed. So the packaging was reduced substantially. Um, besides this engagement with their supply chain partners, they also did a lot of other activities themselves. Huh? So, so less padding material, less paper use, um, reusable packaging material, um, recycled carton, reduced cutting losses, smaller packaging, all of those kind of things really contribute to making that 25% here a little bit lower or substantially lower. And then another example from um, the coffee roasting industry. Um, a lot of our clients, well, we have many clients related to um, uh, coffee roasting. And, um, you know, for them, so they have these roasting machines, they work on gas. For them to work, uh, I had to use different fuel, that's a different, that's, that's a whole strategy. Um, and these machines are often not available yet. However, you see now little by little, that some front runners are starting to, uh, to, 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 to use less gas because they are using other technologies available that are gradually becoming available. So here's a range of options that they are studying together and um, yeah, aligning together how they can reduce their emissions using different roasting methods and different roasting machines. And that's my part. Then um, floor, floor is to yours. Mute myself. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, amazing audience. Um, 
I see in the chat already a lot of interesting questions and answers also, hopefully. It's a very interesting issue and it's a very complex issue. Um, wait, so, so, I think. Um, hey. Yeah, maybe I made some bullet points. Okay, we've heard until now uh, how you can measure the scope three emissions. Ah, there we have them, thank you. We've seen the impact of scope three emissions and we have seen also how to measure them, how to reduce them. Another way to look at these reductions in scope three is to see these as insets, uh, insetting. We all know much about offsetting. Insetting is the new kid in town, you might see. Our customers uh, um, offset usually their residual emissions uh, to become climate neutral organization on top of the reductions or sell climate neutral products or services. And they purchase to do that high quality offsets certified, for example, by gold standard, etc. et cetera. But there's a growing interest in financing reduction projects in their own supply chain. Uh, the insetting concept is a way to move from offsets to reductions in the supply chain to focus on that. How does that work? Yeah, next slide, Ellen. So let's take an example in the dairy industry. We have a lot of uh, food uh, companies, coffee, cacao, milk, cheese. Uh, let's take one example of a dairy company that has maybe 10 million uh, liters milk they bring on the market and they would like to work with us how can we reduce the emissions in the supply chain how does that work how can we inset instead of offsetting uh, the lca of this company is one half kilogram co2 per kilogram of milk and that's the average of all the supply chain and you saw ellen to give some examples of how to figure the whole supply chain to become climate neutral this company has then 15,000 tons co2 to uh, offset that means 150 uh, thousand euro on offsets uh, if you assume 10 euro per ton um this 10 million milk liters that will uh take a thousand cows assuming one cow produces 10,000 liter per year and now we focus in this moment only on the enteric methane emissions and that's four ton co2 per cow per year it's very pragmatic to approach it this way and then those thousand cows have then four times four ton, 4,000 ton CO2. And that is almost a quarter of the total carbon footprint of the milk. And so now we know the number, 4,000 ton for those thousand cows. There are several natural feed supplements available. I think there are more about six or so I see. There's a lot of testing going around. Some are already approved for a, a carbon uh, methodology and reduction using that methane, that methane uh, feed supplement can run up to one ton reduction CO2 per cow per year. It's really interesting. So that is then 25% of the intake me methane. And that means also a tackling 7% of the overall carbon footprint. And, and that's even more interesting for the farmer and also for the carbon footprint is that it leads also to three to seven more percent of production or milk. Okay, so now this company needs to make an insetting plan to be in line with our certification and suppose he will do an intervention on the half of the of the amount of cows he needs so 500 cows he's approaching the farmers can you please introduce this supplement can we work with you can we help you finance can we help you monitor let's try to do that um, that leads to 500 ton reductions so this company might already save 5,000 euro for offsets uh, based on that he have reduced the emissions and on top of that, he adds the value in the own supply chain and on the farm. Yeah, next slide, please. So LCA is known, that's more like an average. And it, the big question is how to go from an average number to real reductions on some farms. You have to do some part of it over. Yeah? You have to need, to, you need primary data instead of secondary data, for example, because you would like to reduce the impact. So first you select this measure on the part on the part of the scope three emissions to tackle via insetting. And then you have to take the emission baseline of that specific farm of that specific part of the LCA. Okay? And that means for a farm, for example, the previous three year methane emissions, if they're measured or in the national inventory or use IPCC methodology to become an average for that farm. And then you can have to uh, replace the LCA part of methane that's usually then one uh, 0.375 kilograms CO2 per kilogram of milk 
with that farm baseline. Yeah, so what were the methane emissions of those cars on those uh, of those uh, cows on that farm? And then you have to apply your intervention, add the natural supplements, do the investment more or less. So that's why you how you start insetting activity, purchasing supplements. Yeah, next slide on the calculations. On the carbon market methodology, that's now in the VCS and SNK for one supplement. There's a formula developed by the company and peer reviewed by, uh, by a scientist to build the baseline, to build the uh, pro uh, project emissions and to build and calculate uh, based on the parameters and data, the emissions reduced. Uh, in that way, you can calculate the generation of insetting reduction units and we place those in our CNG insetting registry. We need to register what has occurred, what were the uh, reduction units and assume we need 500 cows reduced one ton CO2 per year, that it's 500 tons CO2 reduced that will be listed in the registry. And then allocate that to the overall dairy performance. So it's good to realize that for 500 cows, you have to reduce emissions. And for the other 500 cows, you still need the LCA average. So that's how it would work. You have to be very precise in where you have the impact, that you load the impact. But for the rest, you need to maintain the LCA average. And of course, all the above steps need to be validated by a certifying body if it's happening under a certification. There are, of course, no tradable carbon credits generated because otherwise reductions will be uh, uh, claimed double. We would like to have that. Yeah, last slide, please. Uh, let's talk about it. So, okay, the insetting takeaway you see here are some LCAs for other products, a coffee, tea, a banana. They all have farmers in the supply chain and it becomes more and more interesting to add value to that farm. It could be soil, soil carbon, it could be uh, a methane supplements. And it's good to realize now that insetting and offsetting costs are almost comparable, you might say. Uh, but more value is in the own supply chain on the farms. That makes it interesting and that's re-reductions. So it is an interesting approach for dairy, coffee, cocoa, fruits, and also textiles if you work with farmers. And of course, the incremental cost for the supplements should then be compensated by the dairy firm or yield growth. And the insetting concept is, is how we see it as an attractive way to move from offsets to substantial reductions in the own supply chain. And the approach is part of our uh, climate neutral certification standard. And the approach is regarded by SBTI as reductions. Uh, they don't mention really insetting, they see these as real reductions. So what's happening in real life is what you need to show. Thanks. These were our presentations, and we look forward to your Q&A. Thanks. Thank you, Jos and Ellen, for your great presentation and the insights that you were able to share. Um, we have time for about two to three questions, so I'd just like to pick out a few from the audience. Uh, and the first of all, a question might be for you, Ellen. Uh, actually, in part of the can uh, I intro. Share, Sorry. Can I stop sharing then? Yes, you can stop yeah? sharing. Okay. In then part of the uh, uh, the initial part of your presentation, you actually mentioned that with all the clients that you work, you push them to have a 25% reduction by 2030. And you mentioned that it's so important to focus on the scope three uh, emissions there. Could you elaborate on that, why it's so important to focus on scope three in those initial stages? Well, focusing on scope one and two is, of course, also very important, but those are usually the a little bit easier because you, you have a lot of influence on them. Right. And in the end, with a lot of products that are out there, it's really the, the main contributors are scope three emissions. Those are usually the biggest emissions. But it's rightly what you were saying in your introduction. If everybody would reduce their own scope one and two emissions, there would be no need to reduce scope three emissions anymore. Right. So um, and unfortunately, that's not the situation. So scope three emissions are still usually the biggest part of um, the entire footprint. And that's why it is so important to focus on them. Thank you. That's very helpful. And maybe uh, another question to what you shared. Uh, I think a lot of the examples that were brought forward were related to uh, product companies, right? Or those uh, in value chains with raw materials. I saw quite a few questions in the in the chat. And thank you, Jos, for already uh, addressing some of those. Like, what would you say are some key actionables for companies that are much more focused in the service industry? And that might not be working with such complex value chains. Yeah. Well, one thing that we are increasingly starting to explore is also um, for service companies, um, 
the use of the online situation where we're currently in, right? The cloud and all of that and the impact thereof, because it's really considered to be the new flying. So the emissions from flying, we all know, is huge. And if we're now all working from home and um, sitting in our home, our home offices, then, um, yeah, we're sort of switching from one big emission causer to another one. Um, and that, of course, is very applicable to, to um, uh, service providers. So that is something that increasingly is getting more and more attention and should really be on the top of the agendas of organizations such as ours and other organizations. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much. And maybe one last question uh, uh, for you, uh, Jos. Yep. Uh, I think you uh, shared uh, a little bit about uh, uh, the example of the dairy farmer and the cow supplements. And I saw a cheeky question from the, from the chat. It's like, if we're uh, uh, you know, buying cow supplements now. Like, who who should be paying for that? Should that be the dairy farm? Should that be the cheese factory? And I think that's, of course, a very overlapping conversation. If we start, you know, addressing our value chain, who is the one that should be paying the price? Yeah, of course, it's a key question. It's a common effort, of course. Huh? Um, first, or the farmer will purchase it, or the dairy farm. So that will mean costs. But in the end, you have to pass through the costs for climate change uh, reductions to your customer. So that you will be in the shop in the end. And that's always the case. So that's why we have to look also for opportunities there. That's why the supplement is interesting to op for opportunities that also increase yield for the farmer. So then the cost could, could, might become climate neutral. But in your end, you're right, it's always the, the, the consumer that has to pay. But it's very complex, the pricing of milk with the supermarkets, there's a very difficult market. So you would not like that only the greener companies have a more a pricier uh, products and that uh, no, not sustainable firms don't pass through the cost. We won't have that. So it's, it's pretty complex, but it's first important to reduce the cost, right? Limit cost first. And second is uh, to, yeah, to pass through the cost. Of course, thanks. Thank you. Also, maybe a follow-up question to that is like, I think a lot of companies have great ambitions but maybe are fairly small in terms of their own size and hence also have less bargaining uh, power when addressing topics like you know, emissions in your value chain. Do you have any recommendations on how to address this topic also with maybe some much more powerful uh, parties in your value chain uh, when discussing these topics? Yeah, because there are, two, there are two angles. First, if there's legislation, it's uh, good for everybody, right? But as long as there's no legislation, you have to group yourselves. And we work on the demand side and the supply side, you might, might mean. So if you work for a dairy company, we, we look on into the supply chain, but we also work a lot with pharma corporations. And then we help them, okay, uh, prove that you have reduced emissions, that you have stored carbon, and you have to ask a premium on your products when you sell it to the retail. And these days, retail is very interesting in having the supply chain, um, LCA numbers. And they want to know their, their impact. They want to know the numbers. On the other hand, if a farmer is in a group, in a corporation, uh, able to show the lower LCA, uh, the stored carbon, he has a good point in negotiation power because you have something to offer to the retail, to the dairy companies. That means uh, a lower carbon footprint. And you have to realize that banks, financiers, the media, politicians are really focusing on show the impact, show the impact. A lot of farmers are at the moment uh, collecting data. Uh, snack companies are collecting data. Everybody's collecting, collecting data. But the power is if you have something to offer as a farmer, that means uh, the reduced carbon footprint. So you have a good negotiating power. They're looking for you. Uh, lower your footprint and they need you. That will be my advice. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jos and Ellen. Uh, I think just a, a big round of applause uh, from myself and from the audience uh, to you and for all that you had to share. I'm sure there is so much more that you have to share and so much uh, great expertise uh, uh, that you might bring. So for anyone that is keen on also further uh, discussing with Jos and, and Ellen, uh, we'll be circulating the materials of uh, today's session. Uh, it also includes some of the contact details uh, in case there's a, a request to, to follow up. So with that, I would like to go to the second part of today's session, which is our interview with the amazing Carol from Spanish B Corp EcoAlf. Hi. We have you in the spotlight, Carol. Well, it's so nice to do this interview with you. Uh, amazing that you wanted to join us today. I could I maybe start off by asking you, could you introduce a little bit about yourself, uh, about EcoAlf as a company, and maybe also the 
journey that you've undertaken in for what we call addressing the scope three emissions. Yes, of course. First of all, thanks a lot for, for having me here. And it's going to be very difficult for me to, to, to share my presentation after seeing the, the, the previous presentation. So, so, so professional because for us, uh, the CO2 uh, emission, so the, the, to become carbon neutral is something that is really new for us. No? But in fact, uh, EcoAlf is a fashion brand, it's a, a Spanish fashion brand. And we are working for almost 11 years trying to reduce our, um, our environmental impact. So in any way, uh, we have been reducing our CO2 emissions for all these years. Uh, because we are working with uh, from from the raw material, trying to select always uh, recycled material because it's, it's which is the material which is more aligned with the with the eco uh, purpose in any way, and also the rest of the material that we are working with are all all of them uh, low impact materials. At the same time, we, are, we have been working in all the processes, trying to reduce also the, the environmental impact. So we are just starting in, 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 the, in the point which is uh, much lower than any other fashion company in the, in the world, no? in terms of, of CO2 emissions. And uh, we, we signed the, the commitment uh, in the last COP, uh, uh, in, in here in Madrid in, in, in 2019. And this is something really new for us. So we are trying to, to, prefer, to make our first approach to the scope three. I'm going to share with you. It's something really new for all of us internally as well. And so, so just to say that it's our first approach is, is I'm sure it's not going to be the final, uh, the, the numbers I'm going to share with you are not going to be the, the, the final numbers, but we think that we need to start with something. So this is our first approach with uh, for us is very important because now we have in any way the whole picture of our uh, scope three and it's going to be very helpful for us to understand how we, how we can continue reducing the, the CO2 emission because in the part of the raw material is going to be really, it's going to be pretty difficult to reduce much more. So we need to, to start uh, working in the rest of the, of the supply chain to reduce our CO2 emission. And uh, about me, I'm Carol Blasquez and I'm in charge in the company of the sustainability and innovation. And I'm working at Ecoal from the very beginning, so 11 years ago. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to, to learn so much about the CO2 with you. And, uh, and this, this is a big challenge, a very big challenge for us as company. And then we are uh, really excited with this project. So if you want, I can share with you all the, our first approach to this. Would, okay. Yeah, that would be fantastic. I think you have a, a little presentation to share with us, right? About yes. some of the, of the steps that you have taken. And maybe before you kick off, just one little thing that I uh, would like to address. You mentioned COP25, right? Which is, uh, which happened in the, in the fall of 2019. And maybe for some that are uh, not familiar, uh, this was also the launch of uh, the B Corp well, pledge for net zero 2030, uh, and also a lot of where the work on the, on the climate collective has kicked off. So I think it's very exciting that you are able to share a little bit about that as well. And yeah. uh, maybe before you kick off, could I just ask, was that like the start of your journey or just a, a good push to keep moving forward? Sorry, can you, share, can you see me on my screen? Yes, we can okay. see your screen. Okay, okay. So sorry, what, what was this, your question? Sorry. Yeah. We were just, uh, I was just mentioning COP25 and okay. I was just asking you, like, was that for you the kickoff point to really put this yes. topic on the agenda? Yes, yes, yes. it was our, uh, our kickoff and, the, and the, in, during our 2020, we have been, uh, we have been working in the scope one and the scope two, and it has been really easy for us because we only have uh, the office in, in the direct emissions. We only have the, the stores, five stores and the, and the office, and we have a green energy in all of them. So it has been uh, quite easy for us to, to become neutral for scope one and scope three, uh, two. 
the, 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 the <laughs> for us, uh, what is really difficult is, is going to be the, the scope three because it's all our supply chain. So in the textile, uh, you know, the supply chain is, is very, it's quite long and it's quite deep and it's, it's it's, it's very difficult. So the good news is that we have already traced all our supply chains. So it's, it's for us, uh, it's, it's very helpful to have all the information of all our, our supply chain. I'm going to explain you everything, okay? So for us as company, we all, we all say that it's, it's very important, not only what we do, which is the sustainable fashion and sustainable product or trying to, make, to use the recycled material as raw material, but it's, it's very important also what, uh, how we do it, no? And that's why, so here start our journey with the CO2 emission in our commitment in the net zero 2030 that we signed in, in the last scope. Uh, yes, in the last. So, so for us, it's, it's very helpful that we have in, in, in the company uh, one year and one year and a half ago, uh, one tool uh, to have the LCA of all our garments, all our, all our products. And this is uh, all the data that we have are powered by Vicom, which is another, it's, it's just a, a new a Spanish B Corp. It's, 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 it's certified this, this week, I think. So for us, this is very helpful because, because we have the CA of all our product uh, now in, 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 in our collections. So we have the, the data from the from Cradle to uh, Gate. We have all the information from Cradle to Gate, okay? And uh, I'm sorry. So what we are going to see is, uh, is the first approach that we have in the scope three and it had all, the, all the data that we are analyzing, are, can, can, all of them come, come from the, the spring summer collection. So the one which is running now. And uh, what we have done is to, to see how are our emission per category, per family and also per state in order to understand uh, where we are impacting more and how we can start reducing all our impact. So the first, I'm sorry, I'm having some troubles with the page. I'm sorry. Let's see. No, okay. So this is uh, what I was explaining before. So we are uh, we are trying to understand how is our scope three, but before that we already have one uh, very uh, deep uh, information about our tier one, two, three, four, and five. So that means that we have information of all our uh, suppliers and facilities for the tier one, which is the manufacturing, tier two, which is the, the fabric, fabric and, 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 and fabric finishing, and also in all cases for tier three, which is the, the spinning uh, factory as well. So after checking all the information that we have, uh, we see that in our collection, we, we are working with uh, three different families. So uh, the garments, accessories and, and shoes. And the, the one with the highest impact is the, is the, is the garment uh, family. If we, if we go deeper, into that and we see how are our emission per state. So we can see we have uh, the, the emission for all the, the stages that we are analyzing in our LCA. So the, the raw material, it will be only uh, the, 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 the fiber, the origin of the fiber in the case of the natural fiber all the, the the process of the of the of the from the seed, the production and the farming and so on. And the case of the the synthetic is uh, from the from the extraction and the chemical extraction and so on. In the case of the recycle, 
from the waste and the, and the recycling process. In the case of the raw material, and the, sorry, the material processing is, is the webbing processing or knitting processing or, or the, the, depending on the kind of, of, of the fabric. The material dyeing and the garment dyeing, they are two different kinds of, 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 of finishing. If we finish the, the fabric or we finish the, the dyeing. And then the, the workmanship, the manufacture of the garment, and then the transportation and the packaging. So if you see all the, all the data that we have, uh, we are, if we compare all this data with uh, any other company, maybe the, well, maybe I'm sure <laughs> the raw material, the material processes of from the one to the four, for the number one to the number four, it will be a much higher in any other in any other company company and that's why that's why we are working with a, with low impact material no so then if we go here we can we we start having more information no if we uh, analyze per state for each of uh, all all the different families if we analyze, for example, the garment, we see in raw material, uh, we have a lowest uh, impact, but instead for the part of the material processing and material uh, dyeing, we, we can still uh, work a lot because we can reduce a lot this part of the process. But here we have very high uh, emissions in the part of transportation, and that's why uh, that this is because in the last season in the spring summer collection uh, we had some problems with the production and even if we uh, if, even if the flight uh, transportation is avoiding the company we have some problems in the production and we have to fly some part of, of the of the production no And if we see all the mission per category in the part of the garment, we have the different families that we have in the in the collection, which is uh, jacket, sweet shirt, t-shirt, swing sweet, pants, shirts, dresses, skirts, polo, and knit. And here you can see the different emission, the percentage of the total emission of, of this category. And the, you see the, the highest one is, is the jacket. And also this is the, the kind of, of, of product we sell a lot. And also is the part of the, of, the, of the collection that sometimes we need to fly to, to, from, from the supplier to our warehouse here in Spain. Instead, if you see the, the part of the shirt, dresses, skirts, polo, and knit is the part that most of, uh, of, the, of the production is, is made locally here in Europe. So we don't have the impact of the transportation in the, in the, in the total emission of its product. And here we go deeper and we see how are the average uh, emission per kind of garment. So here you see the jacket where we have uh, an average impact of, of, of the, the number of emission now for the jacket, for the sweatshirt, and also for the t-shirt. So you can see the difference. Most of our t-shirts are made here in Europe and Portugal, and the, and the impact is very low because we are using recycled and organic cotton and we are producing here in, in Europe. Instead for the jacket, even if we are using recycled uh, material and the uh, recycled filling and recycled li uh, lining and all the process is, is quite uh, sustainable and very low impact, we have uh, the problem that we have like part of this production. So the, the, the final impact is very high. In fact, we have some part, some part of, uh, if we, uh, for example, this, this garment, which is one of the best seller, a part of, the, of, of, of this production has been flight to, to come to Europe and the, the environmental impact is very high and instead some of the, of the production uh, has been shipped. And in this part of the production, the, the life cycle uh, assessment was, uh, so the final CO2 emission was only six, and um, I don't remember how much, but about, about six kilograms. 
so it's uh, it's, it's, it's much lower. And uh, here you you can see most uh, other categories, other families of, of garments. And here you can see in the swimsuit, we, we have the problem also that we have to flight this part of the production. And if we compare the product, the, the, the final emission flying the, the production is, is the one that you see in red, which is 17 uh, kilograms. But if we, uh, if instead of, of flying the production, we keep the production, the emissions are only 4.5. So that's, that's for me is very important because <laughs> it's, and it's quite uh, complex that uh, we are in investing a lot in the part of the material and the processes. And then in the last minute, uh, due to any maybe a problem with the production, we have to fly the production and we lose all the work that we have already done in the in material, in eco design and also in production. And here we have the same problem with this skirt that uh, due to that, that we have to fly the, the production and the, the emission is very high. And if we, if without the, the fly, the, the fly in the, without fly, fly in the, the production, the emission is only 6.9 kilograms of CO2 equivalent. And the, here you see the polo and the knitting that are very, very low, in fact. And we have the same uh, assessment for all the categories. I don't know if you want to, to go deep in, 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 in all the categories because I think that we are not. Yeah, Carol, maybe I'll just thank you so much for sharing yes, uh, some the of these insights yes. from, from April. This is, this is the, this, where we are in this moment. Yeah, I think it's incredibly impressive how far you've gone in terms of traceability and, and, and data that you have of the uh, of your supply chain. Um, maybe to make it a bit practical, right? I think what we hear a lot uh, from the B Corp community and maybe that you addressed a little bit as well when you, you started presenting is scope tree can be quite challenging to understand, right? And to get started with. Do you recall, like, how was that journey for EcoOff? Like, how were you able to get started in, in, in really exploring the scope three emissions? And do you have any recommendations for our audience here? Um, any tips yes. and tricks that they might apply? Yes, but uh, going, I think, beyond the, the CO2 emission, I think that it's very important to, to, to know, to, to understand, and to, to have a, a map of all your supply chain, but not only for the CO2 emission, because if you want to, 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 be, to be really sustainable in any way, you have to, to understand very well how is your supply chain. No? So we started with this uh, some years ago, and that, that's why for us now it's, it's easier, no? because we know very well all our supply chain. We know all the, all the suppliers that are, are involved in our production. So I think this is the first step. You, you need to know very well your, your, your supply chain and all the facilities involved in all the processes because it's, it's, not, uh, it's not enough just to know who is, is manufacturing the garment. No? You, need, you need to go deeper and to understand who is behind all the, all the different steps. No? So I think this is, for me, this is the first step to know perfectly your supply chain. And did it require a lot of extra effort from your side to, to get yes, to know your supply I, I chain? I have one person here in the company which is only controlling the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And what would you recommend to other companies or participants here in the room that might be looking to get started with this topic, right? And that want to start engaging some of their suppliers. What would you say to them? Yes, I think that is it's very important, not only because sometimes, uh, sometimes the companies, uh, if, so uh, you need to, to understand who is behind all the different steps and you need to be very close to them. Because if you, uh, so you need to, I think for me, the supplier are not just, just a supplier, it's, it's, for me, it's part of the companies because without 
all of them, we are we we for for us it's impossible to have a collection. So uh, you have to to you have to know very well them and you have to, to work very close to them. You have to, to have a very good relationship with them because it's the only way to get all the data from them. If you don't have any kind of, of, of relationship with them and you have only a professional, very professional uh, relation with them, it's, it's very difficult to get all the data. It, you, you, have, you need to start asking for many different data and very deep data. And sometimes for them it's very difficult also to, to get the data that you need. So if you don't have a very good relation with them, with all of them, with all the supply chain, it's, very, it's going to be very difficult to, to, to work in, in the scope team. And also because now we have the information, but then you have to start a, reducing all the mission. And in the scope three is, is, is you, you can, you, you, you need to help them to reduce their, their emission, otherwise you are not going to reduce your emission. So you have to, to work with them, you have to help them to reduce their, their emissions. So it's very important to have a very good relationship with all your supply chain. Yeah, I think what you're sharing resonates a lot also with some of the words of Jos and Ellen and maybe some of the other speakers that we heard today, right? That this is really not a journey you can undertake by yourself, but you need all hands uh, on deck. Maybe as a follow-up question to that, um, if we talk about the value chains, of course, downstream, but also upstream, do you have any interaction with your uh, customers about your uh, emissions? Uh, and how did you engage them in, in, in your journey? Not yet. <laughs> we are working on the, we are one of the things that we want to do uh, in order to become a neutral is uh, in the meantime, we, we, we reduce a lot uh, or the maximum that we can uh, the mission in our garment. What we want to do is to offer to final customer the opportunity of, of, of getting uh, a carbon neutral garment in the, in the moment that they pay for the garment. No, that you, you know, so we have reduced, I don't know, maybe 50% or 70% of the total emission of this product. But if you want to buy a, carb, a carbon neutral product, you can pay for you can pay for the rest of the CO2 emission that uh, that, that the carbon has. No, and the, uh, th this is something that we want to to implement in the company, but we are still uh, working on it. But it's, it's one of the first uh, uh, things that we are going to, because we want to involve also the, the customer and we want to, to share any, some, some different tools with them in order to, to ask them to help us to reduce the, the, the mission. And also in the, in the, because now we are uh, just, uh, we are having all the, the, the the mission only to from cradle to gate, but in the future we would like to have all the information and all the data uh, until the uh, grave. No, yes, until the grave. So we we would like to to share any kind of tools with all our customers to to help them to reduce also the. The, 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 the part of the life cycle uh, of the use of the, the garment. Yeah, I think that's great. Really showing that you're putting in the effort, right? But maybe for those final steps, also asking the help of some of the other mm -hmm. uh, stakeholders of your, uh, of your company. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe a last question before we round up. Uh, in one minute, what are some of your next steps in this journey? Some you touched upon already with the, with the customers, but are there other particular topics that you would like to highlight? Yes, we, that, so this is what I have presented and, and I have to say the first time I share this information, even it, it, here internally, I, <laughs> I have to present all the, all the, all the data. No? But uh, we need, this is our first approach. So we need to go deeper. And also this is the approach only for the spring summer collection, which is very diff different from the fall winter collection. So we need to, to make the approach with the, the whole year, with the collection from spring, summer, and also fall, winter. 
And then the, I think the, the first step, step is going to start working in, in, with the logistic department because we have to work a lot in this area and, the, and, the, and see how we can reduce and in, the, in the different stages. Thank you so much, Carol. Big round of applause for you. And maybe Helena, could I ask you to pull all of our speakers back on the, on the screen with me? Because then we are going to go to the closing. Uh, and I'd just like to, to thank you, Carol. Thank you, Jos. Thank you. Uh, Ellen. Uh, and behind the scenes, we have our amazing Helena also uh, helping us with this, uh, with this session today. I have to say, uh, I'm very happy because uh, anytime I host a, a session, they always give me like the best speakers. And I think today was no exception. So thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. Thank you as the audience for being with us. Hopefully this uh, was extremely uh, useful to you. You've learned a lot. And of course, any kind of follow-up uh, questions, we're happy to help. We'll make sure to circulate all the materials uh, to you. So you have the time to revisit some of the, the information shared today. And then I would just like to say thank you one more time uh, and hope you join us for some of the other sessions during the Climate Summit. That is all for us today. Have a great day and hope to see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.